Welcome everyone to this lecture on signal processing. This is going to be a set of lectures, uh, 32 in total, that are going to be a, uh, an introductory set of lectures on signal processing and sort of all of the mathematical ideas that we need to start uh, thinking about when we take signals and turn them into meaningful technologies or understanding of systems. Uh, much of this work will be highly introductory. I will both present MATLAB and Python codes as we go through the lectures of this course. And so for those of you who want to follow along, I will have a website associated with this, with all the data, with the code, as well as these lectures. Uh, it is uh, mainly framed around a book by Oppenheim and Wilski on signal processing, uh, which is a very basic introductory course. Uh, and so we're going to walk through this, and hopefully you will learn lots of different things about signals and how to take them and make them into meaningful uh, things. So we want to first talk about the kind of the diversity of signals that we're going to record uh, in our technologies or in scientific applications. And so I want to get an if overview of this because we really want to start thinking broadly about signal processing and it all starts with sensors. Sensors are going to be our main objective for research and for technologies which is something that records the environment, brings that information in, and then that's when signal processing takes, takes over for us to start using those uh, sensor feeds to make interesting decision-making uh, technologies. So it's all going to be based on mathematical techniques of what we want to do with those signals, and so we want to start laying down the foundations of those uh, signal processing ideas in terms of the mathematics we're going to be using. So let's start with our number one signal. Uh, for a lot of technologies, we are going to be recording the electromagnetic spectrum. Some part of electromagnetism is going to be involved, typically, uh, from x-rays to lasers to radio waves. All of these are electric fields that propagate in free space or in our environment, in our atmosphere, and are collected at our detector. Typical uh, electromagnetic fields are oscillatory electric fields along with an associated magnetic field. They have specific wavelengths. And in the late 1800s, uh, we sort of had electromagnetism uh, well formulated mathematically in Maxwell's equations, which talked about the relationship between the electric and magnetic field and the interactions with materials. And this was a linear theory. In fact, we didn't really know that electromagnetism was nonlinear until the invention of the laser in the 1960s, where we shone these very intense light sources at different materials and started seeing nonlinear responses. But for what we're going to be looking at, almost everything will be uh, thinking about linear, uh, linear dynamics, especially in this course. So the electromagnetic field is really sort of our number one source of information from our environment that we want to take those signals and process them. And of course, we have a diversity of technologies built on this and a massive diversity and range of frequencies that we're going to be reading off, right? So all the way up to these very high frequency gamma rays to very low frequency radio waves. Our own visible light spectra sits right around here, 10 to the 15th hertz or so, and this is our band of visible light, right? So that this is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we, in our sensors, actually pick up in our environment. But you can see we go from infrared, ultraviolet, and each one of these has an associated wavelength. So here are the wavelengths that we might be looking at, and you can see here light is sort of in this microns regime. And for every packet of, of every photon that's delivered in the electromagnetic spectrum, it has some kind of associated energy, right? So gamma rays are highly energetic because there's a famous relationship. E equals H nu, where H is Planck's constant, and here this is the frequency. And so you can see that packets of energy, especially for high frequency, deliver quite a bit of energy. And in fact, our detector technologies and almost all of our signal processing really relies on energy being delivered from one area to another. So we're going to think about that a lot. So for me to communicate or send information from one place to another, it is important that energy gets propagated across uh, space and across time for something to be picked up. 
So this is an overview of this, and around this electromagnetic spectrum, we have built technologies, right? We have all the way down here uh, in the low frequency or uh, low frequency high long wavelength regime, we have micro, uh, we have radio waves. This is what we've done for for uh, for decades, right? This is our old school technologies of putting up radio towers and television towers and broadcasting. Uh, signals across these very long wavelengths okay and then as you go up in frequency we have the microwave regime this is also where our cell phones 2g 3g 4g 5g have all been sitting in these bands of frequencies in the microwave regime heat is transmitted here in this infrared regime so oftentimes you actually feel this through heat and that's the delivery of energy of wavelengths around this. So this is sunlight, heat, uh, the radiation, heat radiation you feel from heaters and so forth. Go up, you have your visible light, ultraviolet, your x-rays, again we build technologies here, and then gamma rays, this is, uh, this is uh, usually highly uh, dangerous to humans, but we also use it for killing cancers and uh, biological applications. In fact, many medicine, medical applications sit up in this high frequency regime where we can image through the body or target cells or cancers in, in sort of what we wanna be doing. So it's important that we learn how to process signals across this entire band, uh, these, this massive uh, scope of frequency band in order for us to build technologies and devices. This is just this again, again, more technologies here. And one of the things I want to point out here is once you're in this microwave regime, we notice here, I want to point out sort of the, this is where cell phone technology sit. This is probably our number one personal experience with signal processing we experience all the time. We have cell phones, right? So our cell phones, if we have these, we are typically uh, always transmitting information with our families, friends, and, and our, also our, our work. And this is how we transmit that information and, and communicate with each other is these different bands of frequencies that are typically assigned to uh, cell phone usage. In fact, if you were to start a cell phone company, this is how this, this works. Uh, cell phone companies buy bands of frequencies and that they tr transmit at this. So in the low band, which are the lower 2G, 3G technologies, you can see here if you're a carrier, you would actually be assigned or buy a band of frequencies uh, from the FCC. And, and then you could then put your customers on your bands of frequencies to communicate with others. Here's the mid-band, again, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon. Um, and the high band, this is where we start to get more and more into the 5G regime as we go up into these high bands. But this is sort of an overview of thinking about these bands of frequencies that we communicate with are essentially real estate in the spectrum. And so if you have technologies, you can't just do whatever you want with it. You typically have to think about um, how does that work with the FCC? You can't just transmit at any frequency. You have to buy these, and then this is where you can then can operate your technologies. Okay, so this is a, a very common usage of the electromagnetic spectrum. It sits right in here, and uh, you can see it has very practical applications and technologies. And then we have to process all these signals that are uh, being uh, transmitted in order for us to make sense of it into our cell phones. One of the more spectacular signal processing devices we have personally is our vision. So vision itself, we've been studying this for quite a long time uh, throughout history, and we've un wanted to understand how we see. And this eye, to think of this as this remarkable signal processing device where we have photons or light entering into our eyes and, and through our lens, uh, where the light itself gets, uh, through that lens, gets projected back onto the retina. And the retina itself is composed of a bunch of neural processing units called neurons, rods and cones in this case, which take this information and the light impinging on here excites these rods and cones, which then carry down into the optic nerve, to the back of the brain, to the visual cortex for us to understand what this object is and to reconstruct it in our mind. So this is a fantastic signal processing device and it's at the forefront of research and we 
us trying to understand how does this biological signal processing device work? Because because if we can understand how this works, we can uh, help those who have medical issues with vision, uh, but also helps us build future technologies by building bio-inspired architectures where we understand through millions of years of evolutionary pressure that we actually have this beautiful processing device and how can we capitalize on some of the architecture here we see in this eye. So this is a, a really fun area of research and, uh, and still a very active research for, and I'm sure will be for many decades to come. So that's vision and that's the electromagnetic spectrum. But information and energy can also be carried through acoustic vibrations of air. So even as I talk now into a microphone, as I speak, I vibrate the air molecules which send waves, uh, acoustic waves, to an eardrum, which then gets processed and into sound and into meaningful and understandable words for you, in fact, as the, even in this lecture. So let's talk about this in terms of sound itself also has a spectrum of ways to communicate. And here, here's sort of a bandwidth picture of this. And again, for very low sound frequencies, or uh, we, uh, these are very long wavelength. These are things like earthquake. This is called infrasound regime. And then we get here into the acoustic regime of humans, what they can hear. Animals, like your dog, can typically hear at higher frequencies. And then again, if you go to these very high frequencies acoustic waves, you notice that what we get is, again, more medical diagnostics. We have ultrasound, we have uh, lots of different kinds of possibilities for building technologies here. And by using this band of acoustic frequencies up here. So it's uh, rich in terms of both practical technologies, but also scientific discovery and scientific principles like measuring earthquakes, okay? So it's really important not only for a signal for you to understand um, how to process that signal, but also where to put sensors and measure the frequency content of that signal, whether it is the electromagnetic spectrum or the acoustic spectrum, which is given by here. So again, I want to point out the human capacity for processing acoustic waves. And this is it here. Here's our ear where we receive these signals that are vibrations from the air that vibrate the, uh, this, is our, this is our eardrum right here, which then sends uh, information up here to the cochlea. Again, through processing of neurons being fired off, these are our basic, let's call it, biological electronic components, which send information then into our brainstem for processing so that these acoustic waves get processed into words that have meaning for us and sentences that have meaning for us in our brains and so allows us to make actionable decisions on that information or to process it and understand what a person is actually trying to say. So this is again a remarkable, uh, you know, millions of years of evolutionary pressure have produced for us this amazing signal processing device um, and it's still under study, and we'd like to understand this very well because then we can start thinking about how do we build such robust technologies like what we have in our own uh, acoustic hearing um, as humans. Um, there are other pieces of this in terms of not just scientific or signal processing uh, challenges, but we also have grand technological challenges that are current today. And I give you two of them here. One is, and these are both on autonomy. What you see up top here is uh, a robotics uh, piece. This is from Boston Dynamics. And this is quite remarkable autonomy where this robot can do uh, quite sophisticated things. And then here, self-driving car. And both of these are essentially driven by sensors. So what they need is banks of sensors that are robust in processing signals because this robot needs to be able to stand and move and make good decisions about its state. And the same thing with a self-driving car, it has to be able to negotiate and navigate complex environments, all based upon sensor banks in its system. And of course, the better we can process signals in real time, 
and understand that signal processing, the better we have an opportunity to actually make these technologies work, okay? So, because one of the things that we always worry about is if you don't quite do your signal processing correctly, can you, in fact, start having failure modes, right? So these are, uh, in some sense, from its sensors and sensing its environment, maybe not estimating the environment or its own state uh, correctly. And so you can see these are the sort of these very human-like failure modes of these robots trying to do complex things in its environment and, and failing. So um, we would, of course, like to understand this. And one of it, one of the issues here is just, can I do better signal processing state estimation in order to uh, do a better job in terms of understanding its own system and, imply, and imposing some control laws? So those are technologies, but also we can think about this from the point of view of scientific discovery. So one of the most uh, fascinating and important uh, things going on in 2022 is the James Webb Telescope, which was put into space and produced pictures like this. This is uh, a picture of the pillars of creation. It's one of the areas of the sky that has now been imaged with Webb. And this is this remarkable picture. And if you want to see some of the more remarkable pictures of the James Webb Telescope, you can go online and you can download these very high resolution pictures. I believe it's going to transform what we understand scientifically about cosmology. Because every time we've taken big advancements in our sensor recordings and scientific areas, we have made uh, leaps in terms of our theoretical, theoretical understanding. And I think this is going to be the same case with the James Webb Telescope. And of course, when we see these remarkable photos, one of the questions you can ask, or what people ask a lot is, is this really what this looks like? In other words, is that a true picture and it turns out, no, it's not a true picture in terms of the visible spectrum. So let me tell you a little bit about the GEMS web. Here is, again, our electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays. Here is the visible light portion. And let's talk about some of our previous telescopes. Here is the Hubble telescope. And the Hubble telescope sits in the visible regime, and it can measure into the ultraviolet and infrared. And so it has this band of frequencies that can measure here. Okay, there's another telescope, the Spitzer, here we go. But here's where the web sits. Look at the portion of the spectrum it can measure in its, uh, this is its capability of measuring. This is what it's been uh, built to measure is this infrared, very broad infrared spectrum, barely touching on the visible spectrum, right? Just in terms of the, the red wavelengths and so forth. So when you ask the question, when you looked at that picture, is that a real picture? It's not, actually. It's, it's actually measuring infrared light, and then we turn that infrared light into a picture in the visible spectrum for us. Um, and this is how this is done. And so there's a beautiful Scientific American article on this. Um, it's referenced right here. It's in Scientific American, December 1st, so it just came out. And so um, what we're looking at here is a lot of signal processing. So this is fantastic. So it really gets down to exactly what we're going to talk about in this course, which is how is this signal processed to produce those images? So you start off with aperture masking, these micro shutter arrays, spectrographs, the cameras, the infrared field unit, and coronagraphs. So all these are critical portions of a signal processing operation that happen in order for us to produce this final product, which is the pillars of creation picture that we saw. So um, this is exactly what this course is gonna try to go after is, typically when you take the data, look at the amount of signal processing you may do to finally get to, the, to, the, to what you really want, which is the more intelligible piece of, of the data, which is something that you can understand and digest and, and get a better picture of that science. So this is this is all part of what this course tries to address. And you can see here in these technologies, signal processing is everywhere. Any kind of sensor. And you can think about the James Webb as one of the best sensors we've ever built. And that's what the way to think about it. So let's let's take the James Webb photos itself. And let's start looking at this from the point of view of the raw data itself. And here is the raw data itself. So this is what you would actually see from the visible light. And so what there is, is some processing that goes on, uh, some stretching of the image, and then 
looking at different bands. So for instance, here in this infrared regime around these wavelengths, this is assigned the color blue. So remember, it's, it's actually not the color blue. We are reassigning it to the color blue. So we're reading off part of the infrared spectrum and we're gonna reassign it to the color blue there. We go up in here in terms of the number of microns, two microns now. So we're going up in terms of uh, the length of this from two microns to three microns, right? So we're increasing our, wave, our uh, wavelength here. So two microns, we call this green. Three microns, we call this orange. And remember, when we construct an image, typical imaging processing, when we, we, we think about it with an RGB color cube, red, green, blue color cube, and this is how we assign these beautiful color images. And so all we're doing is we're assigning portions of the infrared to different RGB values. And so when we do these assignments at these different infrared wavelengths and eventually up to four microns we assign this red and now we have all four wavelengths all that have been assigned values in the rgb color cube and that allows us to produce this composite picture here where we're actually combining different portions of the infrared spectrum over into the visible spectrum so this is not a visible spectrum this is what you would see if you could actually see an infrared. And so what we've done is done a transformation from the infrared to the visible. And this is exactly what signal processing does. You're gonna take signals and transform them into more useful um, signals for yourself for visualization and decision making. And then you create objects like this. So this is a fantastic, I just think this is the most amazing Thing that's happened one of the most amazing things in 2022 is is this james webb telescope i think it's going to be transformative for science okay um so let's talk about this from a mathematical perspective so first of all signals are going to just be represented all of this is going to come down to mathematical uh construction of the signals and processing of these signals from a mathematical point of view Okay, so we're going to think about a signal here. There's two versions of a signal. There's what's called continuous time signals and discrete time signals. Okay, so continuous time typically are parameterized by here. There's parentheses around here, parameterized by some time t. So we're going to take our sensor and start recording the system over time. So that is typically a way we would always think about these signals. In fact, almost all the examples I've shown you typically are, are this, where you're just recording the signal over time and you're using that signal to sort of make informed decisions or process that to something more meaningful for yourself. Discrete time is I have, it doesn't even have to be time here. This is just a discrete signal in is a way of parameterizing that signal. So you go from N goes to one, two, three. So you have a discrete set of events that you're measuring and you'd still like to understand what is going on with that signal. Typically you have this with bars here plus an integer in the middle. Okay, so for instance, let me give you a version of a continuous time signal. Here is just a picture of uh, energy out, uh, expenditures or energy being used uh, of different you know, sources, whether it's natural, grass, nuclear, electric, solar. And this is over some period of time in 2020, and this is the consumption of those power over time. And you can see here, this is a continuous time signal. So at any time, power is being consumed, and you can see what's how what the consumption rates are over time, over daily fluctuations, over a period of time. And so we think about this as a continuous time because essentially you can measure this at any point in time and there is some finite value associated with it that we can measure. Here is a discrete time signal, just as an example. And this is the SMP yearly return. So we only get one value of this once per year. So the index here is sort of your year, starting from 1930 all the way to the present day. Here are your daily returns. And you can start seeing some very interesting things here. You start seeing what happened in the past. Uh, in fact, you know, all the way down here, this is sort of your Great Depression regime. Right here is a 2008 housing bubble burst. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, watch the movie The Big Short. Uh, but you can see this massive downturn and then now we've been sitting up here and of course COVID hits up here and so this is not as recent uh, to 2020-2021 
but we've also taken a downturn up here. So this is uh, an example of a discrete signal. You get one data point every year and there's no value of a yearly return halfway through the year, okay? So mathematically, you know, here are some canonical representations up here. You just have this continuous time signal, right? Going through time, same thing here. If you look at this as a discrete signal, these are just integer points and then you measure a signal over time. So we're gonna be working with both discrete and continuous interchangeably. So it's important you understand how to manipulate both as we go forward. And here's the basic idea of what's gonna happen in this class or in these set of lectures. We're gonna learn how to manipulate these signals and transform them to more useful things. So we're gonna take a signal, X. <clears throat> in some sense, you could think about this as the raw data from a sensor we're going to process this in some way to get out a signal that we can use to our advantage in technology or for scientific understanding. Same thing with a discrete signal. We're going to take those signals, process them, use them for a more meaningful way after this black box operation here. And in fact, you know, when we talked about the James Webb telescope, remember I showed you like there's at least six things going on here to process this out to produce for you a picture. Okay, so this can be quite complex, what you have here in, uh, in a large series of operations going from the original signal to your end product, whatever it has to be. Same thing you would have, for instance, in self-driving cars or in robotics, you would be taking these sensor measurements, using them here and ultimately producing a decision variable like turn left, turn right, stop the car. Okay, this is the kind of things that we want to start understanding from a mathematical framework because how quickly you can do this often matters in many technologies. Can you process signals in real time to get results as quickly as possible um, and, and, sort of, and have no latency in that? So I've already mentioned this earlier, but signals are essentially packets of energy you want to transmit across space and time. And so we want to start talking about signal energy. So this is the definition of signal energy. You're going to take your signal, take its absolute value, square it, and then you integrate over some time bin. That is the energy in that signal. From the point of view of a discrete signal, this is just this now in discretized form. Again, you take the signal, absolute value, square it, go from N1 to N2. So these are the formulations of energy for both continuous and discrete signals. We can also talk about the power, which is the energy delivered over a unit time. And so the only difference between energy and power is power itself divides by the time bin. So remember, this is the energy here, and then the power just divides over the time bin. So this is the amount of energy over a period of time. So we learn these concepts in you know, your basic, your introductory general physics course. Uh, which is the standard in, in, that you would take in college. And so we learned this relationship between energy and power. Power is the energy per unit time, and energy is the total amount you know, of energy received over a time bin. Okay, same thing here. Here's this discrete version of what power is. Now, we can talk about the total signal energy. And the total signal energy is you integrate over all of time this signal. So in other words, if I have a system and I want to understand the total energy that was expended there, I would just integrate over all the time bin that I have. Um, and in fact, maybe these things can be infinite uh, or sometimes they're bounded. Sometimes I send energy in packets. So I send a burst of energy. It's finite. So when I do this integral, I get a finite value. Uh, there's other technologies where I'm sending continuous waves continu continuously. So the energy essentially, if I integrate over all time, is going to go to infinity. The time average signal power, again, associated with this uh, total is as time goes to infinity. Now I define this in our calculus way, which is I integrate over some t to minus t. And here again, I over the time interval, and I take that to go to infinity. And I call that p infinity. And that's the time average total signal power, uh, both in terms of a continuous representation and in terms of a discrete representation. And there's kind of uh, three important classes of signals. One of the important classes of signals is right here, where actually the total energy integrated 
is, uh, it's actually, sorry, that was supposed to be it's less than infinity. In other words, it's bounded, okay? Uh, so if this is bounded, then uh, what you'd find is the total total power here, if this is some finite value as t goes to infinity, then becomes zero. So you're, you're, you have zero average power, but you have finite energy. So sorry, this should be uh, less, than, less than infinity. Okay, so that's one type of signal. Another type of signal is that in fact, your energy that you integrate over, it's infinite, but your average power is some finite value. Okay, so in other words, you, you get a finite average power, but your total signal is uh, is actually infinity and then other. So these are important classes of signals we're going to consider as we go forward in the class. Okay. Uh, and all signals, remember this: all signals, the way they deliver information across into your sensor is by delivering some kind of power or energy to that sensor that can be read off. Okay. So continuous time, discrete time. Remember, these are our basic building blocks. And so, for instance, when you hear the acoustic wave, finite amount of acoustic wave actually has to get to your ear to, to vibrate that uh, eardrum. Same thing with vision. A certain number of photons have to get into your eye before you can detect signals. So this is what happens at nighttime. There's very few photons. This is why our night vision tends to be, uh, of course, not as good as our day vision, right? Because the day everything is lit up, there's a massive number of photons hitting our retina to be able to make information. And then at nighttime, seeing in the dark is much more difficult because we have much more limited number of photons um, that are being absorbed for us to make uh, these decisions. So that's pretty much the, the main introductory comments on this. This is the first lecture of the signal processing course. And what we're going to do is proceed in these lectures to systematically go through and talk about the mathematical architecture we need and frame this in order to build models for these signals and for how we're going to take these signals, process them into meaningful uh, technologies or, well, or science discovery for ourselves. Thank you.